Hello, Luisa and Matthias. How are you? Very well. We're fine, thanks. This is Marcus Fares from The Zine. Today's screen time interview is with uh, Saarbrook Hutton, Louisa Hutton and Matthias Saarbrook. Thanks to Enscape, our sponsor for this series. Uh, Louisa and Matthias, just tell us a little bit about where you are right now. There's a stepladder behind you. Is that <laughs> <laughs> what's going on? You're doing some DIY. It's in the basement. No, <laughs> no uh, well, in fact, we're sitting in uh, the largest room we have in the office, which we call the project room because we use it in any different way possible. And uh, I guess the ladder's there because things have been moved around recently, but we use it for large meetings, we use it for small meetings, we use it obviously for project reviews and uh, Christmas dinner, everything, it's about 100 square metres. Well, you, 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 you use the step ladder for all those things? Um, no, no, the, st <laughs> the step ladder's only a temporary guest, let's say, but I like ladders, I guess it's from the sort of love of Craig Martin's work or something. <laughs> no, the step ladder is probably a sign of, of the kind of state of our office at the moment because still approximately half to 60% of everybody's um, at home working from home and so uh, there are being things moved around and and organized and stuff like that so that's probably why the things being uh, archived or yeah removed to the model room or whatever. It's interesting because there's been so many zoom calls and skype calls and all of that kind of thing and people have been pointing out that most people tend to put themselves in front of a bookcase and the bookcase obviously is a is a kind of sign of their intellectual prowess and their reading habits but with most of the interviews that we've been doing there'd be no bookcases there's been really interesting backgrounds um space populars was the best they curated the whole background alison <laughs> brooks also rearranged all the furniture in her flat and thought about how the light was coming in and placed mirrors but yours is definitely going to be a ballet later. <laughs> <laughs> yours is probably the most earring, interesting because of the step ladder. And is that a wrapped up painting or something? Is that yes, an art? Well. <laughs> <laughs> I, don't, I don't know whether you did this on purpose or you didn't think that I'd notice. As you noticed, we were a little bit late, so sorry. <laughs> you were, you were. By the way, we, we um, sorry to generalize, but we, we we assumed that German people were the most punctual nation on earth, but... We <laughs> 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 stayed quite a few years in London, so it rubbed off on him. <clears throat> so, but you said that your office is not fully back to, to everyone coming in. So what, how are things in terms of the pandemic, in terms of the lockdown? How is Berlin at the moment? Oh, Berlin is, uh, has changed a lot in the last 10 weeks. Um, public life is far away from being normal. Um, today, as a matter of fact, restaurants are legally allowed to open again, but uh, with kind of endless uh, prescriptions and rules and regulations and distances and mouthpieces and you name it. Um, and, That's uh, fine. And, and the museums have, uh, most museums have opened. Museums are sort of open, yeah. And, uh, and well, sports and any, any gathering and more than 10 people and so on is still, um, not allowed, basically. It's very strange. It's a sort of um, state of siege in a way, very un-Berlin in a way. But it shows the other, the other kind of qualities. Like, for example, the, the parks are wonderful. Today's wonderful weather as well. The spring is great. It's sort of somehow very incoherent, the whole thing. Yeah, I would have found it more understandable if Corona had happened midwinter or something, and then it would have sort of matched the mood. But the fact of all the blossom coming out and the trees, you just want to be outside and it, it is a contradiction, but that's life, that's how it is. We have to deal with it. And where in the city is your office? Tell us a little bit about your setup. How many people do you have? Where is your office based? Um, we're, we're based in, in Mitte, but on the... Uh, uh, northwestern edge of it, it's a district called Moabit, which is um, traditionally the um, the district where the French population in in Prussia uh, was uh, had its heart, its center. Uh, as you may know, there was a lot of uh, French immigrant Huguenot immigrants who came into Berlin in the 18th century, and they set up their own district with their own uh, jurisdiction and everything else. Uh, and that's where we are, but it sounds rather romantic. In reality, the whole thing turned into an industrial quarter um, later on. And today is uh, sort of, well, it's very central. It's very, that, therefore it's very nice. And it's kind of very close to the Tiergarten and everything. Yeah, it's right near the main station. 
but and, it's uh, but it's a little rundown. Yeah, so. but then you find you still find the children of the children of the children of the original mulberry trees from the Huguenots. So that's quite nice. So there's a bit of the sort of living history of the plants and things is still there. And tell us a little bit about Sabro Cotton. How long have you been going? And um, uh. <laughs> you see, <doing> great. <laughs> we were saying before, Louise, that we've we've definitely met, but it was so long ago, neither of us can remember. <laughs> It must have been in the last century, probably, mustn't it? Must have been when? In the last century. Yes, yeah, it was, probably, it was. It was in the probably. 90s, I think. Yeah. Well, uh, we've been going for about 30 years, a bit more, actually. And uh, Matthias and I met in London. In fact, we met while we were still studying at VAA. And then both worked for various practices, different practices, Matthias for um, uh, Elias Angelis at of uh, OMA and myself at the Smithsons. And then we decided to set up our own practice together at the same time as teaching uh, in the late eighties. And we were lucky enough to win, to do a bit of a fast forward for a few years. We, we did small conversions and jobs, that sort of thing one had. And we won a competition for quite a large building in Berlin in the early nineties. And we then realized that we should move to Berlin kind of lock, stock and barrel, although we kept a small office in London at the time for about six years. And uh, do you want to carry on? With the <laughs> <laughs> setup? Hand over to Berlin. Yeah, <laughs> <set up. laughs> yeah um, well, I mean, for a while we were entertaining uh, the idea of having offices in both places, but it was so disparate because in London we were known for small, as Louise was saying, small flat conversions and so on while we were doing these really large projects. I mean, we carried on doing competitions and things like that in, in Berlin. Um, that in the end, it became unfeasible for us to travel to London, uh, you know, for every client decision and so on. So we centered ourselves in Berlin and, and since then have done work in London, as a matter of fact, from Berlin. Or Sheffield or the or UK. Anywhere from, in the yeah. UK, yeah. Or anywhere in Europe from Berlin. Which, of course, was easier when a the UK was part of the European Union decidedly <laughs> and B while uh, air traffic was still in full function. Um, so, I mean, it was, as a matter of fact, probably economically speaking, it would have been easier to do a project in Sheffield from Berlin than it would be from London as a matter of fact. But anyway, so uh, we, for a number of reasons, we engaged then in a lot of uh, projects all over Europe. I mean, not necessarily in Berlin for a long time, um, and and today, we're, well, we're working at the moment probably more in Germany than elsewhere, but still have projects all over Europe. Um, one in South America, but otherwise not no Far East, no uh, no Middle East either. Um, and we're approximately 100, uh, something like that. And it's kind of going up and down, of course. Um, and yeah, and they're all in this building. We're in, in a in a former uniform factory which is built in approximately 1880 or something like that and uh, we converted it and extended it and uh, it's 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 a great location very nice actually very green if you you can't see but out of the windows that you of, from which you can't see in the image there's it's like a, a big park with lots of uh, different trees and everything well i think you've got a little presentation to show us some of your work do you want to fire that up now yeah, yeah. Maybe, maybe as an introduction quickly, uh, it's kind of difficult to kind of, you know, in, in whatever short time. So we decided to choose 10 slides that are uh, a little bit showing what we have been doing and people who know us will know obviously those projects. And we have 10 slides that are more recent works and they're kind of maybe leading a little bit into the future. So, I mean, I'll just try and share the screen. Um, That good? Can you see? Yeah. Can you see? Okay. So uh, I'm going to discuss these first uh, ten slides, which basically show three projects that proved, in a way, quite key for three main strands of our thinking that continue today. And this this shot shows, um, well, it's a photograph in Berlin with our GSW headquarters, which I'll talk about in a minute at the background. And then the foreground, you see an example of what was the prevalent idea at the time and still is in many cities, but definitely in Berlin, which was the idea of the rediscovery of the traditional European city and rebuilding it. Um, coming from Rossi's La Stettura della Città, 
from the 70s. And in fact, this happens to show a Rossi building that he divided uh, artificially into various segments. But when we came to do the competition for the GSW, which is the site on the left with this building that was conceived in the late 50s and finished in the early 60s, you see the condition was not that, it was the modernist um, city. And we didn't want to deny the history of the site and wanted to include the old tower in a positive way in a new conglomerate or ensemble that you can see on the right which included a low rise to close the street, as well as a very slender high rise you can see in the background here. So it was one of viewing the city as a palimpsest of various layers of human endeavor, and not wanting to favor one period of history over another. And um, <clears throat> this is a gallop through the project, of course. And on this view, you can see the other side of the building, which is the west facade, which shows um, a full 70 meter long, 70 meter tall, thermal flu of about one meter <clears throat> on this side, which is an illustration of one of the main aspects of the sustainable um, aspiration of the project, which is to provide the high rise with natural ventilation. And you can see the summer view on the left and the winter view on, on, on the right, sorry, other way around, summer obviously on the right where there are more colored shutters. And for us, it, it began to be important to try and show the sustainable aspiration of the building in a very positive way as part of the aesthetic aspiration, as part of the aesthetic expression. And in a way, the building becomes a dynamic urban painting showing the habits of the um, occupiers. Um, it's the first time we use color on such a large scale, having used it in the London interiors. And then the uh, final slide is really showing, again, a view from the West with our building on the right. And this is showing another layer of the history, which is the Cold War in Berlin, where you see the strip between the political uh, West and the political East uh, on the left of the slide is the East. And we wanted to, in a way, um, work with the city as a landscape going above the layer of the 20th, uh, of the 18th and 19th centuries and really using the as found uh, condition and celebrating it and including uh, these references um, of a, at a higher level in the city, which leads me to the next project, which is uh, the Federal Environmental Agency in Dessau, where again, you could say it's looking, working with the as found of the site, which in this case was a um, ex industrial area, a brownfield site, very central in the city and with various old industrial structures on it. And we needed to design a huge building for 800 employees. And we shaped it so on the site that, well, of course you never see it like this unless from a plane. So you only ever see a part of the building at once and never realize its um, enormity and creating a park going through the site as part of our um, strategy. Um, of course, this building being for the Federal Environmental Agency needed to be the mother of all ecological buildings. And this is just a diagram showing many of the uh, measures we use to achieve um, this aim. The main one being uh, a, a lot, very large five kilometer long labyrinth in the earth to temper the air in the building. Um, what became important for us, again, similar to the GSW building is to expose the many of the instruments of sustainability um, to the public and onto the facade, both exterior and interior. Here we're outside and you can see the louvers within the depths of the windows that bring in cold air at night to flush through over the concrete ceilings um, on a hot summer's day or a hot summer's evening to pre-temper the building. And again, the use of natural timber um, as a natural material combined with the color of glass. Um, so we enjoyed in this case to use materi materiality that's very uh, sensual, that attracts you optically, but also corporeally, because you're always moving along the building. You never see it in true elevation. Which brings me on to the third project with the museum, Brandhorst in Munich. Here you see the street view with the main entrance in this large, what we call the head building. Um, a ceramic clad uh, structure, which I'll come on to in a couple of slides. And if you come into the main entrance, uh, you come into <clears throat> a building that is dedicated to art. And I'm going to show you the space above, which is uh, 
a very particular space for a work of art that will hang permanently. And it's to show that we designed the interior of the museum in subservience to the art, not uh, wanting architecture to take the first role at all, and showing a top-lit space for this singular work of 12 paintings of the Battle of Lepanto by Cy Twombly, where with a single move of your head when you're standing on the left, you can see all the paintings at once, and there is no hierarchy between them, which you would have had had you made a rectangular space with breaks. Um, and to come back to the facade, most people will probably remember this building if they've been in it or along it because of the facade, which is made of ceramic um, battens that are mounted on top of a folded rain screen that in fact is perforated to absorb traffic sound. And what we enjoy is the, um, not only the optical effect of the facade that draws you in a bit like the paintings of the 20th century when color and form were separated or separated themselves, but also the more sort of corpor corporeal sensual aspects of the facade. And indeed a photographer or an artist, Ole Kola Minen, made this work, which we think is much better than any documentary photograph can ever be. And this for us gives the feeling of walking along the facade and almost getting sort of entangled with its uh, sensuality with your own body. And I'll pass over to Matthias. Okay, so just a few uh, preoccupations now. I mean, obviously, color, as you may have gathered, is, is, a, is a big theme for us. Uh, we've been working with color as a material. We've been working, trying to manipulate space with color and so on. But of course, it also becomes a little bit sort of like a formula and, uh, and, uh, and it's been copied a lot as well. Um, and not always to its best advantage. And so we are kind of looking at other kind of ways of achieving similar um, uh, or should I put it, tension between the visual quality and the kind of actual physical reality of a building. And this is a residential building that is entirely clad in highly reflective stainless steel, which uh, is deliberately chosen very thin. So it kind of creates this um, beautiful uh, sort of war warbly sort of surface that reflects its environment. And it's for other reasons interesting. I mean, we uh, housing, uh, obviously everywhere is a, is a big problem and we find the conundrum that it seems to be impossible to create um, a kind of reasonable uh, building at uh, such cost that it can be affordable. Um, we find that really um, somehow depressing. I mean, it's depressing for the profession, it's depressing for society. And so mm. we were looking and getting together with clients who are kind of looking for alternatives to that. And this is what in Germany is called a Baugruppe, which is a sort of like a group of people who, who get together to hire an architect and uh, do their development themselves. And it's the same building, as, as you can see, it's put together from very simple components, uh, sort of garage construction and so on. There's pre prefabricated elements almost chosen from a catalog. And the empty floors are sort of like loft spaces with all the kind of services and anything that's needed to maintain either workplaces or residential life in the external walls. And here's just an example of one floor. It has a big balcony on one side, which is both balcony and access. And you can cut it sort of like a loaf of bread or something into various units. And it's used for residential and uh, working. And this is a project that's <coughs> um, just about to go on site now. It's, it's similar in its kind of makeup. Again, it's a kind of very enlightened client who is working with us here, uh, but it's more, it's not a single building, it's a whole ensemble. We call it La Petite Familistère, um, as after this um, uh, example in Gies in northern France, um, which is sort of one of the early socialist um, housing experiments, it's not quite as radical, but it is an attempt to kind of include people who are normally uh, marginalized in the market. And it's incidentally also a building that is entirely made of timber um, in all, all of its components. And this is a project that we completed, uh, completed I don't know, 2008 or something, 10? I can't remember, some time ago anyway. And it's led us, it was an experience that led us into a certain direction. You can see a detail here. It's, I mean, it's a, it was a um, computer building um, built in the 80s and we converted it to an office building, added one floor, uh, put entirely new facades, uh, 
all the kind of services, all technology was renewed, but we kept the, um, the, the, structure. the structure, the concrete frame. And we discovered that the, the, I mean, having been, you know, researching ways of sustainable building for decades, um, we discovered that actually in the built fabric and the gray material, the gray energy of the material, there's so much potential, I mean, that you can hardly match with all those kind of clever facades and all those kind of clever pieces of smart pieces of technology that man may or may not put into a building. It's actually, um, in this particular instance, we calculated and we discovered that not building a new concrete frame was worth six, uh, 34 years of heating. So, I mean, that kind of made us wake up a little bit and make, made us much more aware of uh, the potential of existing fabric and its uh, the potential of its adaptation and use and so on. And this is a project that was la built uh, relative, or finished relatively recently. It's in, in Mestre, which is on the mainland of Venice. It's an urban renewal scheme combined with a museum. And, uh, and here, it's a combination of many things, really. It's an interesting museum. Uh, it's a totally digital museum, but it also is a kind of urban, a kind of social hub, if you like. Um, there's a bit of renovation. We, we renovated a, a 16th century convent and it turned into a sort of um, a co-working and commercial place. Um, everything very small and kind of modest in a way. And it's a, it's a very... Um, uh, how shall I put it, uh, sort of for mystery, revolutionary insertion into their uh, small town fabric. Uh, very interesting as a opposing model to the mainland island. And of course, all of that is up in the air at the moment and the future of this place is so probably not very certain at the moment. Anyway, and there's a final project, which is a science center that we finished last year. Um, in uh, Heilbronn, which is a city outside Stuttgart in southern Germany, and it's a, it's it's really a place for learning. It's a, uh, it, 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 the clients call it a, an extracurricular place for learning, and it's it's a cathedral, if you like. It's a cathedral to learning, um, and uh, yeah, that's it. <laughs> <laughs> Great, thank you very much. Um, one thing I was going to say. Actually, if you could unshare your screen, yeah, thanks. That um, one thing I was going to—I noticed at the beginning, and I've noticed through following your work over the years—is that some of the buildings you do are absolutely enormous. How did <laughs> 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 so you said that you started off in the UK designing modest projects and interiors and stuff, and then suddenly you landed all these enormous corporate headquarters and ground scrapers in Germany? How how did you? Get those projects and how do you manage to how do you manage to tackle projects of that scale that it's, it's hard to design a building that big right a single building uh, it was coincidence really. it was complete coincidence but the gsw building the first one i showed was an extension so it kind of fitted into our London portfolio of rear extensions, <laughs> rear extensions <laughs> if you like. Right, it, it's a rear extension of a massive corporate. <laughs> yes. And in fact, maybe our naivety at that stage in any, any, any way was quite helpful because you, we, we just kind of did, it, it was a bit like a student project in a way. You just do, do uh, as any, any time you do what you believe in, but it was, uh, we were surprised to win it, put it like that. And, um, and what is GSW? What kind of organization is Here GSW? There is a housing association, as a matter of fact, a rather large one um, in uh, the, the four allied status uh, during the post-war period in Berlin. There was virtually no housing and there was no property market because obviously very few people were investing in, in, in a city that's surrounded by, by communist states. So um, all housing was really built and looked after by state organizations, which were in effect large housing associations. And GSW was one of them, which was founded in the 30s already. Had clients, had architects, there were, there were clients to architects like Mies van der Rohe and Hans Scharoun sure. and uh, various others. So it was but a after great the organization to work for. And, and we had a fantastic client uh, yeah. who didn't fully understand because at the time we didn't have an office in Berlin, it was in London, didn't quite fully understand how inexperienced we were. <laughs> and in fact, they needed, they, they needed to expand their headquarters because they had re-inherited back about 18,000 properties from the former East. 
So that's why they needed to expand their uh, headquarters. And how has the housing market changed since then? Um, you were talking about one of, in one of your projects was like a cooperative project, right? It, it, is the housing market still dominated by these kind of socially driven landlords or has the private? No, 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 no. sadly not. That's uh, an exception. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the neoliberalism hasn't uh, spared uh, Berlin in, in, the, in the 80s and 90s. All, almost all housing sto stock has been sold. I mean, uh, GSW has been sold. It's now a, a, a privately uh, owned company. Um, and, uh, and most of the stock's gone to some uh, investors who uh, kept them for, I don't know, few years and, and then, then sold them on. started to sell them on and so almost all of it is gone uh, it's rather like Britain as a matter of fact I mean admittedly there was a lot of it in Berlin because it was this exceptional uh, situation and one could have probably sold some of it but now at the moment politicians are scrambling to buy some of it back which is really <laughs> too late ridiculous, I mean, yeah. but anyway it's, it seems the only only way because as I said the lands become so expensive that it's difficult to develop anything within the city that is um, affordable. Um, and it's, uh, it's, it's a little bit depressing. But Berlin being the city that it is with its war history, it does have some kind of pockets of land or you know, strange leftover spaces near infrastructure or whatever that can still be found to make housing. And that's quite good. Or building on top of a supermarket or somehow finding these unusual places that are less, more difficult to find in London, for example, because it's so, so much more developed. And you mentioned, I mean, when, when I first came across your work all those years ago when, you know, when we were young, the, the, the colour was the thing that made your work stand out. I mean, not many architects were using colour as boldly as you were in those days. Matthias, you mentioned that that got copied and so you're sort of trying to find new ways to create the same effect without the splashes of colour. But how did that whole colour thing come about? Um, how did you... Um, convince clients to go for something that really was very, very unusual in those days, and still is, in fact. Um, I mean, it, it really happened through our particular individual interests. I mean, we were we met at the AA, and, and we were doing sort of using color and, and using or doing painting and stuff like that in, in school already. And uh, having this first, this GSW organism, I mean, we were experimenting with it in London, but on a domestic scale and it mostly in interiors and things. But having this um, uh, GSW, this organization as a client at the time really helped because, I mean, A, they were run, it was run by a very enlightened CEO at the time who was exceptionally loyal to the whole competition procedure and us as the winner of the competition. And B, there is a certain, uh, I mean, they, they have a history of modern architecture and within modern architecture, there's obviously a history of color. And if you think of Dessau, the, um, uh, the Bauhaus buildings and the so-called Meisterhäuser, the master houses, which are just around, more or less around the corner from the project that Luisa just showed, um, they're intensely colored. And there's a sort of, there's a sort of architectural tradition, if you like, even though as you, rightly point out, I mean, it's been forgotten or kind of uh, slightly also cannibalized in postmodern times. Yeah. And is somehow to come back to it on a sort of uh, more kind of intellectual level, maybe less decorative level and so on. Uh, yes, was indeed a kind of um, uh, new at the time. Yeah, and, and there's fantastic amount of tout in Berlin, obviously, <clears throat> which is kept in very good condition with beautiful trees and landscape and uh, really amazing use of color. Fantastic. What did you say in Berlin? Uh, tout. Bruno a, lot, a lot of Bruno tout. Uh, fantastic housing. Um, also in Magdeburg. Useful, a very, yeah. very beautiful use of color yeah. and very radical. I mean, like, uh, you know, they're so tiny houses. Yeah, from 1913. Pitch pitched roofs uh, with little gardens, and, but they're black. They're totally black, <laughs> <Or> then, <laughs> sitting red, somewhere in the country. Next door to a red one, and then an Eve Klein blue one, and then a checkerboard <laughs> yellow and gold one. And Yeah, pretty amazing, pretty amazing stuff, yeah. So uh, yes, of course, there, there has been a tradition of color, and um, particularly in, in historic architecture. But I guess what I wasn't used to seeing was that color applied to big office buildings and things like that, because from in my experience, they tend to be steel or glass or concrete. So that was a real surprise to see 
color being applied to such a monolithic building? Well, we were lucky in that we didn't have so many um, speculative office buildings um, in our portfolio. We quite often mm. were working with uh, owner occupiers. And like the GSW. The GSW yeah. or also ADAC or, uh, or the or fire the, station or the city of yeah. Hamburg and so on and so forth. And then there were people who were interested in this debate. And, and, and we would always and still do if we want to use color within the language of the building, use it at the time of the competition. Of course, it develops then afterwards. But the client, when you win a competition, the client is part of that decision and the jury has chosen it with the client. So that so in a way, you already have the project that where the color has implicitly been accepted. And as you say, that use of color has been widely copied, often quite badly. Especially <laughs> yes. <laughs> Fortunately, we see ourselves kind of uh, sometimes a bit depressed, yes. <laughs> but um, being so familiar with both Germany, Berlin, and the UK, London, what do you think of the, the key differences in um, attitudes to architecture and, and, and the acceptance, particularly of ideas about housing and sustainability, because sustainability is clearly a core part of your work, as it is in lots of German architects' work, because I think the laws there are much more um, forward thinking in terms of sustainable elements to buildings. I think in in London with the office, we, we, we've only done one office building in London um, at the Old Bailey. And there it, we, we went quite a long way with the client to try and have at least a degree of natural ventilation in a kind of hybrid building where you could choose whether to have natural ventilation or not. And in the end, the, the client said, yes, well, well, let's park that one and we'll use it in a few years. And now let's do our fully air conditioned building with, you know, a deep plan floor space. And it's so much more like America. And the, I think the, the price, the price of the square meter is a driver. The fact that the building was meant to be for lawyers or bankers was a driver who didn't want to have anything natural in the building. Or it is a, it's a very different mindset, I think. And um, I, as well, in, in Germany, you have uh, laws that protect the workers that you need to uh, sit relatively close to a window. You need to have daylight. You can't even sit under a roof light because the sky, you can't focus on the clouds. So it's, it's, it's much more... Um, geared towards well-being, I think, in Germany than in London, which is much more of a capitalist um, approach to uh, building as a financial product and let's uh, get the most as we can out of the square meters. But yeah. as far as sustainability is concerned, yes, you're right. I mean, the, um, the legislation is maybe a bit tougher here and it's maybe a bit more advanced, but it's uh, the debate, I think, I mean, in terms of the ideas and in terms of uh, some of the origins as well, I mean, I, I think the UK is, is right in there. I mean, we were basically... Uh, yeah, we came with our engineers. GSW, we did together with uh, Chris McCarthy and... Um, Guy Battle. <laughs> Guy Battle, who we, at the time were working at Arab and, and the whole Arab work ethic of integrated thinking and so on is something that was really... Uh, one of our first and quite important ex uh, experiences. So I think we, we did bring a lot from, from London um, to, to what we're doing here now. But, and also, I mean, another aspect, which I think is, is uh, a universal phenomenon is that sustainable architecture is really, it's not really clear what exactly it is, you know, as, as I was trying to hint at um, when I was showing this, uh, uh, this kind of renovated or this kind of converted building, um, this whole, thinking of uh, uh, optimization of uh, performance of uh, increased efficiency and so on has really reached its limits and uh, and uh, in a way I think the debate is kind of slightly switching um, and it's and the kind of debate around materials I mean we're doing a lot of timber at the moment a lot of timber buildings the materials life cycle and so on is only part of a kind of wider view of um, sustainability, which must include social aspects. And now, particularly after COVID, um, I think we'll have to include uh, questions of uh, lifestyles, working, housing, and so on and so forth. So I'm, yeah, we're, we're basically following, trying to follow the path that was set in, in London, but in a sort of slightly different environment now. Mm. 
<clears throat> what was nice was that Arup came with us uh, at the time. They set up their office in Germany with the GSW project in Berlin. Um, but yeah, I think seeing the city as its own resource of built material that can be reused and reused and reinterpreted. Mm. And it's, uh, we, we do many projects that reuse uh, the existing structure in some way or another. And the, in fact, it usually leads to more inventive architecture. Um, most architects find that, I think. But, uh, Matthias, you said just now you feel that the whole debate about sustainability architecture is, is switching. Can you clarify what you mean by that? So moving, moving, a, you, you feel like you've, the profession has done as much as it can to optimize new build structures and therefore the, there's more work. Yeah. To be I mean, it, to that's things. part of it. That's part of it. I mean, it's, I mean, as I, if I take the general legislation on the continent, if you take Switzerland or if you take Austria or Germany or, I mean, also the Netherlands and so on, um, the, uh, the, the level, I mean, if I compare to GSW, the, the expectation in terms of um, uh, energy consumption are that much lower than they used to be and, it, and this change happened very rapidly mm. as a matter of fact in within 20 years or so I mean the, the, the figures have been cut by two-thirds or so so I mean in a way what was a kind of like a, a real sensation at the time reducing 40 percent of the energy for ventilation or so it's become the new normal um, but at the same time, I mean, like, for example, with the uh, environmental agency that Louisa was showing, um, it's one of the projects where we had a very thorough analysis done. The building was monitored very thoroughly and the figures are also publicly available, which is not the case for many projects. And we have to, we found out that um, the performance of the buildings is really largely dependent also on its inhabitants. So, I mean, you can, you can design all these kind of tricks that you have to open the window and do this, that, and the other, and night cooling and da da. And if the client, if the, the user later on doesn't really warm to these ideas, doesn't really, uh, you know, cooperate as it were, um, it's very, very difficult to achieve what you, uh, what you think you could achieve when you're in the design process. So <clears throat> you have to, um, you have to resort to means that you really can control. And I think, for example, the choice of materials, the choice of construction methods, um, the, the whole setup of uh, projects and so on and so forth is something where architects really can get involved and particularly when they have the clients who think along can really make a difference. And I think if the building, if the building um, is somehow is loved by the people who use it, if it, if it sends out uh, messages of um, wanting to be used and cared for then people will care for it it's a, it's a very i think it's quite an emotional thing how attached you feel to a building where you work or not so we try i mean that's another aspect of trying to make the buildings very um sensuous and really enjoyable to inhabit as well as to see in the street that people identify with them as somewhere they want to look after and it's not a neutral gray office space or technological space but something that they feel is almost like at home in some way. Matthias you showed that the housing project you showed you said it was entirely made of timber is it really entirely made of timber the whole this whole everything, super, yeah. Uh, everything. Mm -hmm. yeah it's only for it's only four stories high so even the cores and even the lift shafts are made of timber <laughs> Uh, and uh, and of course we are uh, using cross laminated uh, timber which is uh, needs uh, glue yeah, yeah as glue it's not uh, they're not there are versions where you combine the um, the timber layers with uh, dowels and that's entirely timber that we're not using we, we can't afford that but it's uh, otherwise it's all timber materials yeah everything. And is the, the use of timber in architecture something that's being widely accepted and promoted in Germany and the UK? No, no, no. It's, uh, we're at the total beginning. I mean, timber is associated with uh, alpine, you know, chalets and, uh, <laughs> and, and suburban kind of dachas and uh, uh, I don't know what, um, uh, pre-alpine pitched roofs and, uh, and so on, Bavaria. Uh, or certain traditions like timber frame buildings in northern Germany and so on. Um, there is no real... Um, contemporary practice of timber it's starting but it now. is starting yeah now, starting all over yeah. in a way uh, thankfully and that really is to do with the fact that timber 
I mean, is an unbeatable material in terms of energy use and uh, and carbon dioxide footprint and so on. CO2, yeah. Um, and uh, <laughs> there's this theory. I don't know whether you've heard of Hans Joachim Schellenhuber. He's a he's a sort of professor here in 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 Potsdam. Is leading the uh, sort of climate institute, which is in Germany is very important, and they were sort of advising the government and everything else. And he, he was asked uh, recently, I mean, what, you know, what can, what can you do in, as a kind of single person? What can you do in order to contribute or kind of try and stop climate change? I mean, is changing, uh, separating your, your waste or kind of like, you know, not driving, not using the car, going by public transport and so on and so forth. And he said, most of that is really insignificant. I mean, the one thing you, you can do is build a timber building because the timber building sequesters, I mean, it's absorbing carbon dioxide is, uh, out, out of the atmosphere. And if you assume that then the forest is being replenished, you basically have a double effect. So, so that's, that seems like a route to go. So your, your project is, one, is going to be one of the first contemporary all timber buildings? No, 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 no. No, one no, is no. the first. No, there are, there are a few around, yeah. but not so many. Uh, there also, as you know, there's various... Uh, efforts to create high-rise buildings as well, or quite dense buildings, urban buildings, but they are mostly uh, combinations of concrete and timber. Um, and uh, the higher you go, the, f the more decorative the timber becomes, actually. But, uh, but still, uh, there is a, a lot of this, uh, research going on. It's interesting. Also, in terms of prefabrication, we made a student housing project in Hamburg, which does have concrete cores and a concrete table on which to place the units, but it has over 370 timber modules that were prefabricated in Austria and just installed on the site in a few months. So you can save a huge amount of time as well as uh, cost in terms of prefabrication and modular building. Yeah, the, the whole prefabrication or fabrication in general, I mean, it's obviously up for grabs at the moment. It's all changing. Uh, and I think COVID will probably expedite a few, uh, a few developments as well. Um, these uh, prefab or semi-industrialized building sites where large components are being made off-site, they're obviously fantastic in terms of sites. I mean, you don't, you know, everything happens very fast and it's very precise and uh, not so much trouble with all the various trades and all of these kind of things. So I think a lot of the uh, practice will go that way. Um, uh, and we, we're sort of part of that yeah. change. Yeah. So you've mentioned um, the changes that coronavirus may force upon architecture. So what are your thoughts on that? You talked about um, um, prefabrication, that being a, a more appropriate technology, is that, I guess, presumably to, to to, to, you don't need so many people on site then. How, how else do you think the, the virus will impact architecture, the way people live, the way cities function? I mean, I think <laughs> what's very good about it is it does put a huge emphasis on the quality of public space and the quality of parks, the availability of parks, planning enough parks in, uh, for uh, residents of cities. Um, I think the quality of interior space of one's home um, becomes crucial that there is enough space to work from home. I think many working practices will change. There will be much more home office, um, at least for part of the week. And we'll probably have it uh, at our office that many people will work at least one day a week from home. So somehow one needs to provide uh, yeah, housing with enough space for that and with enough light and view. I mean, all the qualities that one needs to and will provide anyway but it becomes more important obviously during a lockdown what how your interior space is that you uh, feel um, that it's a generous space to live in um, and in terms of the density of the city this i think this will be an ongoing discussion whether the idea of keeping cities very dense particularly at nodal points of transport whether this um, will continue as an argument for uh, urban environments, we believe it will do because we think cities need to continue. We don't believe that everybody should uh, fly to the city, fly to the countryside. Um, so I think density will become something that will be hotly discussed, mm. um, as well as transport, of course. Hotly discussed, and, but in, in what way? What way do you think it will change? 
very difficult to predict, but I mean, obviously, there's a there's a conundrum that we have an ex we have existing infrastructure, and uh, obviously, we're trying in terms of climate change and everything else. We're uh, we're trying to maximize public transport, and, and of course, the hygiene rules say the opposite. You shouldn't use public transport. You should keep your distance. You should avoid kind of dense whatever railway stations and so on and so forth. Um, so I I think. Uh, we don't have solutions right now, but I think we will, as architects, planners, designers, we will have to think how we somehow uh, merge these uh, conflicting uh, requirements into new spaces. I mean, uh, obviously, I think also workspaces will probably mm. have to become much more spacious. I mean, we'll have to accept that this one and a half meter distance will be staying with us even after the vaccine. and. Uh, you know, uh, it, it, there's definitely a change, um, I think. And of course, what happened in the uh, 1910s or so, uh, or 1890s, um, when, um, you know, just tuberculosis and typhoid and various other kind of uh, diseases within the city, and then um, city planners decided to open out and go into garden cities and kind of, uh, uh, you know, de-densify the city and so on and so forth. I mean, I think that's not really an option anymore. I think we'll have to somehow find ways to bring that kind of spaciousness within a kind of very urban context. And you, you showed the, the housing project that's um, half complete and you talked about the, the large balcony there, which I think you described as a, a slight a loaf of bread that can be sliced up or something like that. Uh, yeah. Are there requirements of housing in, in Germany that there is some outside space or a balcony or, or is, is that something that's going to become more important in the future? Uh, balconies are, yes, well, they're not a requirement, but I mean, they're very they're not, usual. They really are, yeah. I think, under, I think no architect would plan yeah. a building without a balcony. No, this, this particular building, which is finished, by the way, is the same building. It's next door here. Yeah. <laughs> um, it's just combining... Um, if you want to cut it the way uh, it was shown there, you basically just need to have a, a corridor. And instead of putting the corridor into the middle of the building, you put it on the outside and made it very wide. So it also becomes a social space and you can sit there and basically people sit in the sun there. And, and when there are kind of two or three apartments on one side, on one half of the building, then people walk through each other's balconies, which, uh, which it's works quite very, nice very in well. A small I mean, and in fact, that all timber one has the same thing on the inside of the courtyard it's all the access balconies and stairs. So you're sort of, hopefully, hopefully one is helping to create the community through the architecture. And so, so it's very- balconies, balconies is a big theme, uh, by the way. I mean, I mean, obviously if you don't have a balcony, you're kind of eight weeks in your apartment, it's absolute hell. You know? It's like really difficult. So that is, balconies are something that are a requirement or-, or, or no, not It's not, not, not so a, common yeah. that you always have yeah, yeah, you have, you do have them. Yeah. yeah. And how else do you think architects can help um, people who live in apartments cope with lockdown? I, mean, I guess they could have bigger balconies or roof terraces or, or something like that. Do you see any of those initiatives becoming more widespread? I mean, I guess to, to think of a workplace, I mean, it's ridiculous that when, when you work with a commercial client or so on, um, it, the, the format of the, of the apartment is more or less the formula from 19, I don't know, 45 or 1962 or something like that. It's you, you make a, a living room, a kitchen, you make a bedroom, master bedroom, children's bedrooms and so on and so forth. I mean, and then that's obviously um, doesn't really, I mean, in Berlin, like in any other kind of European um, capital, you have more than 50% uh, of the population being single, so single households. Um, and then now, from now on, or latest now on, I think uh, most of these people will be also working at home. So I think the whole setup, um, there will have to be something like an office that maybe can convert into something else and so on. And, uh, and somehow you have, yeah. and you have to think of also a community within the building. Exactly, I, mean, I think so communal many, spaces yeah. become really important. If there are so many individual people who don't, who are not allowed to see anyone else, you know, you somehow have to create this sort of family in a way. And architecture can help, I think. Yeah, I think I think to convince a client to build communal spaces for a bar or to, to have the washing machines or just a social space, I think that shouldn't be too difficult if they're already building 
20 or 50 flats in, in one or two buildings, I think it becomes very obvious, particularly when the flats are small. Well, we're almost out of time, but we do have one, one question. Um, Francesco asks, how much of your architecture has been influenced by budget constraints and how have you managed it? Uh, obviously, budget constraints yeah. like in I think any other offices. I think virtually 99% of our projects oh, God. Oh. Are, do have severe budget constraints. And um, it's, always a it's discussion. part of reality. Yeah, it's always a discussion. And, I, and budget or any other kind of requirement somehow often makes you think again i mean you have you develop something you have a design and then there's all of a sudden this cost engineering or there's some i don't know what change of regulation or whatever and you kind of have to rethink it against your own will and in 95 percent of the cases the end result is better than what you started off with so i mean one should see budget restraint constraints as a sort of positive as a say. A, a, a kind of way of of, of raising the competition <laughs> and making you making you even better making you think more of course that has its limits but i mean nevertheless one has to work with it so if somebody came to you and said i have an unlimited budget would you say we're not interested <laughs> <laughs> no yeah, but it's, I mean, it's never happened really but um <laughs> sort of yeah, I, yeah you, you i mean basically the design process is it's defining, you know, it's making fi finite uh, and, uh, limitations, you know, and, uh, and as you, the more you discuss, the more you can rule out certain things and then certainly um, it might not be all about finance, about cost and so on, but I mean, you make decisions over what you think is more important and what's less important and so on. And there might be different sets of criteria, but it's a similar process. In I mean, it's always nice to have a client who can let you decide within the budget where you spend the money. So for example, to allow for nice door handles that are good to touch and look good or solid timber on the doors and then you save somewhere else. But it, it does get upsetting when the projects get so value engineered out that one doesn't have room for maneuver. So it's really, one, one hopes for an uh, iterative and helpful discussion with the client on how to spend the budget. Brilliant. Well, thanks so much, Louisa and Matthias. Great to see you again. Thank you. Thank you. I hope to see you again before too long in the real world. Exactly. Yes, yes, we absolutely. will keep in touch. Let us know whenever you come to Berlin. You uh, can yeah. see the Silver Building and our offices. We'll no, take care of it now. No so, current plans to travel, of course. No. <laughs> <laughs> as soon as that changes, I'll let you know. Okay. All right. Many thanks. Thank Bye -bye. you. Bye.